Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. And today I am uh, shooting this video not for getting a lot of views or a lot of subscribers or something like that. Uh, because uh, as I have seen in my earlier videos that 90% or more than 90% of the people they are not subscribing rather viewing the content and uh, giving likes that's fine but uh, until and unless you subscribe the channel I won't be able to understand that uh, you people are really liking the thing and you want to get updated for uh, the next video uh, of this upcoming you know upcoming video of this channel so today uh, I'm just uh, making some study material sort of content for my students who are uh, sitting back at their home and uh, in this period uh, lockdown period obviously they are sitting at their home and um, today I'll be giving them some some uh, material so rather I'll read out a poem uh, which is known as the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales this one and I'll be using this book uh, worldview critical uh, you know edition this one edited by Harriet uh, Raghunathan I, I guess you people can see this you can uh, take a screenshot and you can also buy this book but uh, for now you don't need because I'll be giving uh, all the important things of this uh, you know one lines 1 to 42 to you and I'll also be sharing um, the entire text with you on screen and also the modern format because this text is written in Middle English dialect as you know and it's very tough to understand Middle English uh, so that's why it has been uh, converted into modern English so that it's uh, easily legible to us and that's what I'll also be sharing with you so before going into the poem we need to know something about the author this person uh, Geoffrey Chaucer Chaucer was not merely a court poet but occupied a kind new kind of social position in Brewer's B-R-E-W-E-R -E -E in Brewer's words he was the new man quote, quotation within quotation he was the new man the literate layman who was not a clerk the courtier who was not a knight, he was not poor like Langland, but not rich. A salaried man, not landed gentry like Gawar, G-O-W-E-R obviously. He was not even a merchant like his father and grandfather. Unquote. So basically he was uh, someone very different from the defined terms. Uh, it is likely that Chaucer visualized his audience as the multitude of household knights, officials, diplomats and civil servants who constituted the court in its wider sense rather than exclusively high-born lords and ladies. Now, Geoffrey Chaucer represents the Middle English literature, right? Chaucer and I guess another person is William Langland. But the thing is, Geoffrey Chaucer, he is still considered to be the modern man, though standing in the era of Middle English literature. Why? Because he thought his thought process was a bit out of the box when the other people, they were sitting at the court and writing courtly things and uh, they were giving rise to the ideas about the aristocratic society, the kings, queens, churches and everything else. Chaucer was the person who looked beyond that and he went outside the church, outside the court and uh, wrote a pilgrimage sort of thing, you know, uh, a poem which talks about pilgrimage and pilgrimage, this pilgrimage doesn't constitute only one layer of the society but various layers of the society. So standing in that era, he was already having modern thoughts and that is why he is still considered to be the modern poet of English literature. Uh, music, dance and military exercises as well as French and Latin would have been part of this education. It is possible that Chaucer attended a London school such as St. Paul's or St. Mary Lebao before he became a page. We know that authors like Setius, Virgil, Lucan and Ovid were in St. Paul's library in 1358. Chaucer served as a soldier in a campaign of 1359 to 60 in France and was captured and uh, later he was also ransomed. 
He also served under John of Gaunt and a military expedition to Artois, Picardy, and Normandy in 1369. Chaucer's rank is therefore arms bearing. His rank was of arms bearing uh, to bring the arms from one place to another to, to carry it. Equivalent to a gentleman. He also became a valetor or yeoman of the chamber to the king Edward III by 1367. At the time, Edward III was a king of, uh, you know, king, and it was in 1367. So he became a valetor and was employed on diplomatic missions to Spain, Italy, and France in the late 1360s and early 1370s. Now, at that time, Chaucer he got the opportunity. Of going from one country to another, of visiting various countries, of visiting various types of societies, and he was not only a visitor. And you know what? In in the modern perspective, in 2020, if you go to visit, suppose if you go to Spain, if you go to, uh, yeah, if you go to France, not now obviously, but uh, uh, after this this lockdown session, every problem, we 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 the humanity comes out of all the problems uh, that we are facing right now. If you go to France, you will be taking a camera and clicking all the beautiful sceneries over there, beautiful art artifacts. Uh, buildings, towers, and all those things. At the time, camera was not available for sure. So this person, he had the opportunity to observe the city, the observe various countries, observe people, and observe uh, men living into the society of the then country or contemporary time. You know what I mean. So they could, he could actually enjoy uh, his visit to the fullest not like us we do not enjoy our visit to the fullest but we act like fools even if we go to uh, watch a program we, we start doing videos you know Facebook live and all that shitty stuffs why we do not enjoy uh, the time being over there so always enjoy every moment where you are like you go to a library, enjoy the books. If you go to a program, enjoy the singing or dancing with your eyes and ears, not with your camera and show it to someone else. That's not the thing. Anyways, let's come back to the point. Chaucer is associated, is associated with John of Gaunt, one of the king's sons who, through marriage to his first wife, Lanche, came into the title of Duke of Lancaster, as we know. Later, Chaucer is listed as an square in the king's service by 1372 and went to Italy and the next year on the king's business. From 1374, Chaucer took up duty as controller of will custom and subsidy for the port of London, a job he kept for the next 12 years. So finally, he stabilized himself for 12 years to a place, you know. Chaucer became a justice of the peace for Kent and in 1386, having given up his customs work, he represented that country in parliament as one of the two knights of the shire. By this time, such positions were held by people who were not true knights by birth, but squares and country gentlemen. As we know, Chaucer was not a true warrior. He though went on war. Warrior means uh, he was a warrior for sure, but he was not a knight. I mean, the chivalry thing was not associated with him. You know, that's what I mean. Now, let's come to the next section. The social change of uh, 14th century. You need to know a little bit about it. I'm just uh, reading out. Chaucer lived in a time of rapidly accelerating social change and even considerable turbulence. Though his works very rarely mention topical events in a direct way, they still reflect the trends of his time in an indirect manner. And in the general prologue, a new social mobility and the replacement of a feudal outlook by social aspirations and the desire for wealth is obvious. The Hundred Years' War with France in 1337 to 1453, we might, you might know about this thing, the Hundred Years' War, and if you don't know, please Google it and uh, know something about it. It's very important. And its resultant taxes, the Black Death in 1348 to 49, or these years might vary, 1346 also, few people say Black Death, which uh, mainly, uh, which, which uh, wiped out one third of the English population of the time. 
so it's also very important and you have also an english movie hollywood movie black death you can watch the movie um uh, on I, i guess it's not available on youtube or it might be uh, you can go to any torrent site and you can download black death the rising uh, or peasants revolt in 1389 and various economic developments are perhaps the main causes for the crumbling of the feudal system that accelerates in this period so feudal system was falling apart now what is feudal system it's a triangular triangle sort of thing uh, the king is at the top the barons the squares the knights uh, they are uh, you know periodically they come downwards and their number increases and at the last stage or the last line of the triangle is the normal people so the taxes that were they which were collected from the normal people they were shared step by step by step to the king and the king was the supreme person of that time so it was um, you know it's it's called the feudal system in bengali shamantotantrik vyavastha as you know uh, you can also google it and uh, know something about it there were also tensions and divisions in the church with two popes each claiming authenticity and in england many complaints of its corruption and oppressiveness especially among lollards i will not get into this this thing lollards because uh, it's another stream of study and their sympathizers in the last years of the 14th century just uh, for certain information i'm telling you that uh, in one word lollards means they were the followers of wycliffe john wycliffe okay that is the thing so uh, chaucer he was standing in the perspective of uh, a turbulent sort of thing of the society at the time now you need to know something about the black death the black death which reached england in 1348 i am uh, reading this book and uh, i'm reading out from this book and this book tells it's 1348 i think i read another book of antony twain where it was uh, stated like 1346 or 47 anyway was a devastating outbreak of bubonic plague spread by rats and fleas in the insanitary conditions of the time it carried off a third or perhaps nearly a half of the population of england one third or nearly half of the population of england which had stood at about 3.25 million at the time the plague attacked both rich and poor and was terrifying in its swiftness probably like uh, modern times you know whole communities disappeared many people left without family members entered the religious life but there were also some more positive results such as unexpected legacies from relatives who died of the plague also the widespread deaths in the countryside led to a labor shortage obviously uh, you know a plague in a plague or uh, in an epidemic sort of situation the people who die mainly mainly are the labor class uh, they belong from the labor class because uh, they are the most unhygienic part of the society don't mind from my words unhygienic doesn't demean them because they are the most important part of the society the laborers the villagers at least they are there in the society we can't even thrive the middle class can't even thrive you know the status of laborers in 1351 attempted to control both wages and the statute of laborers they tried to control what is certain things but they failed uh, the medieval poet langland in his pious the plowman reports that peasants now wanted to be paid with fresh meat or fried fish rather than old cabbages penny ale or bacon so yeah obviously as uh, the laborers were getting decreased by certain numbers so what they try to was increase the uh, wage uh, now you know uh, when i was a part of the calcutta university and um, js ma'am jorna ma'am uh, she used to join uh, professor jorna shanyal i think uh, she used to take our class and uh, uh when when she uh, went through the introduction of this topic uh, she told us one sentence which i wrote as her quotation on the last page of my book okay uh, so uh, she said each age quote quote and quote each age has its own way of storytelling each age has its own way of storytelling 
now uh, let's get back uh, to the poem and uh, yeah i'll be i'm not going through the middle english version of this poem the original version i'm going through the modern version obviously so that it's uh, easier for you to understand when the uh, when that april with its yeah when april with his shower sweet with fruit the drought of march has pierced unto the root and bathed each vein with liquor that has power to generate therein and sire the flower when zephyr also has with his sweet breath quickened again in every holt and heath the tender shoots and buds and the young sun into the ram one half his course has run and many little birds make melody that sleep through all the night with open eye so nature pricks them on to ramp and rage then do folk long to go on pilgrimage and pomos to go seeking out strange strands to distant shrines well known in sundry lands and specially from every shire's end of england they to canterbury went the holy blessed martyr where to seek who helped them when they lay so ill and weak now this canterbury is a place of pilgrimage uh, in northern england and um, if you want to know certain thing why canterbury became a pilgrimage uh, center sort of thing you can read a play written by t s eliot it was i think it was published in 1953 the play's name is murder in the cathedral there he certainly shows the reasons of canterbury being a pilgrimage center and also i will let you remind that this person t s eliot he was not only a normal writer he was someone who who uh you know who who spec uh, uh, beyond his words probably and that's why you can also question if you read that play you might question the idea of martyrdom the martyrdom another person who did uh you know accept martyrdom with open hands or open openly his name is jesus christ and you might question you might question that whether jesus christ he seeked martyrdom or he got martyrdom anyways so please read that uh, play if you want to know more about canterbury befell that in that season on a day in south york at the tabard as i lay ready to start upon my pilgrimage now uh, this this uh, in i double n in 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 means some resting place or hotel or motel sort of thing so the inn's name was tabard in t a b a r d from where the writer and his other companions they started for their pilgrimage we fell that in that season on a day in south york at the tabard as i lay ready to start upon my pilgrimage to canterbury full of devout homage there came at night fall to that hostelry some 9 and 20 in a company of sun tribe persons who had chanced to fall in fellowship and pilgrims who were they all so there were 9 and 20 that means 29 people present over there that toward canterbury town would ride the the rooms and stables spacious were and wide and well we there were eased and of the best and briefly when the sun had gone to rest you know in those times there was no electricity or sort of thing uh, charcoal was the only fuel that was used and uh, that's why after sunset they used to have their uh, supper and they used to go to bed so that time he talks about uh, that time the rooms and stables spacious were and wide and well we we, we there were east and of the best and briefly when the sun had gone to rest so had i spoken with them every one that i was of their fellowship anon and made agreement that we would early rise to take the road as you and i will apprise so they will rise early that was the clause uh, given by the author and uh, they will set on their journey but none the less whilst i have time and space before yet further in this tale i pace 
it seems to me accordant with reason to inform you of the state of every one of all of these as it appeared to me and who they were what was their degree and even how arrayed they are at the inn and with a night thus will i first begin so now he begins uh, here he ends the prologue and he begins with a night Uh, the general prologue actually doesn't end over here; it goes on. Uh, but as we know that uh, we have um, up to here uh, lines one to forty-two, and this is the Middle English one. You can take a screenshot. This one and uh, this one up to line forty-two. So. uh this is the original text now this there are certain words i will go through the notes word notes which is very important chaucer's language here with a classical reference to the west wind zephyrus if you read the poem you will find it uh zephyrus and the unusually long sentence of 18 lines first sentence or the first full stop is there at the 18th line after 18 lines you know and the unusually long sentence of 18 lines is more rhetorical and stately than is normal tone it was a medieval convention to set a poem in spring time and to begin with a formal description of the season <coughs> sorry so at the time the poems they started with a um, certain introduction of the season uh, and uh, most of the poems were written in spring because the that season was of mellow fruitfulness um, the other words uh, of the other poets april in england is probably the first month in which the upward roads of the time would be free of heavy mud and convenient for pilgrims to travel so the pilgrimage uh, starts at uh, the early april every year the april showers fill the sap vessels of the plants with the moisture moisture liquor as it has been stated in the poem that has the power or strength to generate the flowers the gentle west wind breathes life into the young shoots in every wood and heath the sun is young as the new year was considered to begin in march not january at the time the first sign of the zodiac it was the sign of the zodiacs that uh, you know uh, wrapped up the entire year uh, it was the first sign of the zodiac aries or the ram ran from 12th march to 11th april according to the uncorrected calendar then it was in use and the sun has completed the second half or the april half of its course in the prologue to the man of law's tell the host gives the date of the 18th day of april perhaps the second day of the pilgrimage in other words they don't sleep at all as nature or natural instinct stirs them in their courages hearts or desires in chaucer's parliament of fowls nature is a queen of noble goddess who presides over the birds choice of mates nature should not be pronounced as nature n a y c h e r but as nature o with three syllables n a hyphen t y o r hyphen u h nature nature that was a middle english accent uh <coughs> pamers or pilgrims pilgrims as pamers p a l m e r e s pamers or pilgrims or to the holy land wore a piece of palm leaf they used to wear a piece of palm leaf in their hats to show where they had been and that's why they was known as pamers the pilgrims a uh, strong uh, strons s t r o n d e s a variant of strands means shores s h o r e s shores halves h a l w e s halves it means shrines is derived from the word for saint or holy person a uh, coat c o u t h coat means known or familiar coat c o u t h e and survives in the negative form uncoat coat uncoat it's also used in uh, modern english but the spelling is different canterbury cathedral house the shrine of thomas becket I'm telling something about Canterbury Cathedral. Canterbury Cathedral housed the shrine of Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had been murdered in 1170. There's a question between this murder, uh, uh, not between. There's a question behind this murder, and the question is raised by 
T.S. Eliot in his play Murder in the Cathedral. And canonized in 1133, the shrine was probably the most popular goal of pilgrims for many years. It was destroyed by Henry VIII in 1538. The canter or comfortable easy gallop gets his name, uh, gets its name from Canterbury. So this shrine was destroyed. Uh, this place, pilgrimage, uh, pilgrim, uh, pilgrimage point was destroyed by Henry VIII in 1538. Okay. Uh, South York is a borough on the south bank of the River Thames in London. It was a convenient place for pilgrims to gather before taking the road to the southeast out of London. A tabard is the sleeveless embroidered coat worn by worn as ceremonial dress by Hennels and the tabard inn had a sign depicting a tabard hanging outside. So the word tabard means a sleeveless embroidered coat and in this tabard inn they had a sign of that tabard hanging outside and that's where the name tabard inn comes from. As English pubs and inns have painted signs today, there was an inn with this name in South York in Chaucer's time. Then, um, yeah, the, the things uh, are very easy after that. You don't need any word notes. Now, uh, let me let me tell you in short something about this prologue or rather the story. Okay, just wait a bit. Yeah. The narrator opens the general prologue with a description of the return of spring. He describes the April rains, the burgeoning flowers and leaves and the chirping birds. Around this time of year, the narrator says, people begin to feel the desire to go on a pilgrimage. Many devout English pilgrims set off to visit shrines in distant holy lands. But even more choose to travel to Canterbury to visit the relics of St. Thomas Becket in Canterbury Cathedral, where they thank the martyr for having helped them when they were in need. The narrator tells us that as he prepared to go on such a pilgrimage, staying at a tavern in South York called the Tabard Inn, a great company of 29 travellers entered. The travellers were a diverse group who, like the narrator, were on their way to Canterbury. They happily agreed to let him join them. That night, the group slept at the Tabard and woke up early the next morning to set off the journey. Before con continuing the tale, the narrator declares his intent, his intent to list, yeah, to list and describe each of the members of the group. So, uh, in the introduction part or uh, in the prologue part, we'll find the introduction of various characters, all these characters who are going on this pilgrimage. 29 feet men. Uh, not men, I'm really sorry, 29 pilgrims, uh, they had males, females, people from various layers of the society along with the author. And this author, it, it was his, uh, you know, he wanted everyone to introduce themselves and this is how all the layers of the society could come together. This uh, word... Uh, this this thing can be termed as a German uh, by a German term called Gesamtkunstwerk. You can search on Google Gesamtkunstwerk. That means the intermingling of various layers of the entire society. And that's why I say to you time every time that Chaucer, this is the reason he was considered to be the modern man of English literature. Those standing in that era of the middle english period i think this was enough for today please do entire watch the entire video and uh, if you like this video to subscribe to this channel for the further updates and whatever i have said i'll be giving certain uh, screenshots of the modern english version of this prologue to canterbury tales line 1 to 42 and if you have any problems, you can comment in the comment section and you can tell me about your problems. Thank you for watching this video. Uh, bye for now. Uh, we'll be
seeing you in the next video thank you